Welcome to the technological companion for the video lesson titled Hypothesis Testing from the Mathematical Science Research Launchpad. In this tutorial, we'll demonstrate how to use MATLAB to perform hypothesis testing for various discrete and continuous distributions that are used to model both measurements and sampling techniques. We're going to be looking at a series of hypothesis testing examples over discrete distributions. And in most cases, we'll be computing some pretty small probabilities in these examples. So it's going to make sense to display our numerical output and scientific notation. To do that, we'll issue the format short e command. And that's just going to ensure that all of our numerical results are displayed in a scientific notation with four decimal places of accuracy after the decimal point on the mantissa. Our first hypothesis test involves the binomial distribution. And in this example, a pharmaceutical company has just developed a new kind of blood pressure me medication that it is ready to test on human subjects. The company is hoping to gather evidence that supports its claim that this medication is effective at returning blood pressure to a normal range in patients who suffer from hypertension. In order to do so, scientists employed by the company designed the following experiment. A group of 40 patients known to be suffering from hypertension are given the appropriate dosage of the new medication and are told that it will treat high blood pressure. This group of patients is known as the experimental group. Four groups of 40 patients each are known to be suffering from hypertension as well, but they're given a placebo pill and they're told it will treat high blood pressure. These groups are known as the control groups. After enough time for the medication to take effect has passed, a technician measures the blood pressure in each patient in the experimental group and in the four control groups and records whether or not it is in a normal healthy range. In order to minimize the possibility of measurement bias, the technician does not know which of these five groups is the experimental group. Using Fisher's methodology, the company decides to model the behavior of the control groups with a binomial distribution having parameters n equals 40 for the representing the number of participants in each study group and P, the probability that any one person is going to see an improvement in their blood pressure levels, has to be estimated from the numbers of patients in each of the control groups who have blood pressure in the normal range. This distribution will be used to test for a significant increase in the number of patients with a normal blood pressure in the experimental group. The control data collected by the technician shows the following results. We're just going to represent our control data in an array containing the numbers 20, 18, 25, and 23 and store that array in the variable D. And we only have one experimental data point. We only have one experimental group. And we know in that group that there were 31 uh, participants who saw that their blood pressure returned to a normal value after taking the medication. So we'll store that value in, under the variable x equals 31. We're needing to calibrate our model distribution for our control groups. So we'll assume that the number of patients in any of the four control groups that register a normal blood pressure is a binomial random variable with n equals 40 and that unknown value of p. So we'll estimate p using maximum likelihood estimation and we'll follow the lead of previous examples that we've worked through in MATLAB where we'll use MATLAB's MLE function to perform our estimation. We apply it to our control data set D. We specify that our distribution is the binomial distribution. And since we know the number of trials is equal to 20 stored in the variable N, we'll supply that information to MLE as well. And then finally, we need to perform our hypothesis test itself. So we're going to formally establish a null hypothesis, H sub zero, that states the number of patients with normal blood pressure in the experimental group will not be significantly greater than what the control groups lead us to expect. So the corporate researchers administer the blood pressure medication to the patients in the experimental group and observe that 31 of them end up with blood pressure measurements in the normal range. That's what leads to our knowledge that x equals 31. Our random variable takes on a value of 31 for the experimental group. 
According to the binomial model that we've chosen for the control groups, the probability of observing at least this many subjects with normal blood pressure measurements is our p-value that we're trying to compute. We're representing the probability of observing a data point at least as extreme as the x equals 31 observation that we've made. And so we'll use the binomial distribution to do that. We're trying to calculate the probability of an upper tail of that distribution. So we want to know the probability that x is greater than or equal to 31. MATLAB's BINOCDF function is capable of finding the probability of a range that is strictly greater than a, than a given value of the random variable. So since it works with that strict inequality, we have to decrease our input value for the binomial distribution by 1. So we're going to supply a value of x equals 30 rather than x equals 31 by inputting x minus 1. Then we input the values for n and p and supply the flag upper, the optional argument flag upper, to indicate that I am wanting to compute the probability of a random variable observation falling in the range that is strictly greater than this input. So let's put all this code together and run this block that we're currently in and see what our results are. And we end up with a p-value of 1.6871 times 10 to the negative 3. So that's a pretty small p-value. We would say that that's significant in most reasonable, ex reasonably designed experiments. We'd say that the null hypothesis, in other words, is not really sufficient to describe regularly observing a value as high as x equals 31 or higher. It's not something we would expect to see most of the time. So that's what significant means. We should reject the null hypothesis in this case because it's really not appropriate for describing such a large value of x. So that doesn't prove that the blood pressure medication worked, but it's indicative that there's something going on besides just a placebo effect. Our next hypothesis test is going to be illustrated with, with really two versions of the same example. Because this is going to, in addition to demonstrate how to perform our particular hypothesis test, the hypergeometric test, it's going to explore the idea of good and bad experimental design. Okay, so a game designer at a state fair allows participants to select n equal 5 small plastic containers from a barrel that contain a total of capital N equals 1,500 containers. So that's a total population size. After each participant plays the game, the game operator restocks the barrel in order to ensure that it always contains k equal 120 containers that contain a prize and n minus k equal 1,380 containers that are empty. The operator of the game notices that one participant seems to be playing regularly. Worse than that, the participant seems to be winning regularly. On one day, the game operator observes that the participant plays six times. Out of each session of five selections, the participant receives the following numbers of containers that contain a prize. So this is going to be essentially our experimental data set. So they win two prizes out of their first selection, one prize out of their second, three out of their third, and then one prize out of each of their fourth, fifth, and sixth selections. We're going to store that array under the variable name D. So the game operator feels suspicious that the participant is somehow cheating, so they decide to perform hypothesis testing in order to determine whether or not to ban that participant from ever playing again. He models the game with a hypergeometric distribution parameterized with the theoretical parameter values of n equal 1500 for the total population size, k equal 120 for the preferred population size. This represents the number of containers that contain prizes and little n equal 5 to represent the sample size, the number of containers a participant is allowed to select on any one play, any one trial. 
He'll use this distribution to test for excessively high numbers of prizes found in a selection of five containers. Then he defines the null hypothesis. H sub zero, which states the participant is not winning a significantly higher number of prizes than someone who randomly selects 20 containers from the barrel. The game operator uses MATLAB's HiGCDF function to compute the p-values for each of the six times the participant played the game. He does this by, remember we're testing for a significant increase in the CDF functions in MATLAB can be used to test for an increase by computing the probability of an upper tail of the distribution if you supply it with the optional argument of upper. But the way it works is that it, it's calculating the probability that your random variable takes on values strictly greater than your first input value. So we want to know what are the probabilities of observing values at or above each of our experimental values, 2, 1, 3, 1, 1, and 1. So since the high GCDF function is calculating not the probability of observing values at or above those, but strictly above those, we can make the translation by just subtracting 1 from each of our values and using that as the input. So we do that as our first input for the random variable. We supply our known parameter values for capital N, capital K, and lowercase n. And then once again, we supply the optional input argument flag of upper to indicate that we're testing in the upper tail of the distribution. So let's run this block of code to see what our results are. You can see that our p-values are a little bit of a mixed bag. 5.4078 times 10 to the negative 2 is just a little bit more than 5%. Next p-value is 34%. The next p-value is pretty unarguably significant. It's 4.4344 times 10 to the negative 3. But the remaining p-values are back to 34%. They're, they're not significant at all. So we've got four p-values that are clearly not significant, one that is significant, and one that's kind of borderline. It's close to 5%. It would be hard to look at this data and say that it's anything but inconclusive. At best, it might be that you just look at those highly insignificant values and say that this data is just not significant, and maybe we've looked at a couple of random outliers that led to those two significant results that we we found. And so when you're going to the stage of trying to determine how you're going to interpret your results, you've got some decisions to make. In this case, before drawing any major conclusions, I'd take a step back and suggest that perhaps these inconclusive results could just be a result of poor experimental design. We have results of observing one prize per container, two prizes per container, and three prizes per container in our experimental data. And those have corresponding p-values of 34%, 5.4%, and 0.044%, so less than 1%. Those are some pretty big jumps, taking just a single step from one to two to three. So that difference between one prize and two prizes in a container is pretty high stakes. You're going from just being marginally significant to very insignificant just by the difference of one prize in the container. And then two to three prizes in the container involves a step of just over 5% to 0.04 four, four, three percent. So from marginally significant to very significant. That could really be a design issue. It might be better for the game operator to allow the participant to have a larger sample of prizes so that the associated step in a p-value from going from one value of x to the other, you know, maybe from having four prizes and five prizes, is going to be not so big. 
it's going to allow us to resolve the difference between somebody who's maybe playing in a way that's dishonest and somebody who's just lucky. So what we'll do is revise this example. So we're going to consider the following alternative design that the game operator could have adopted in order to determine if the participant was winning an unexpectedly high number of games. And all the game operator is going to change is that the participant is now going to be allowed to select n equals 20 plastic containers from the barrel instead of, uh, of just five. In fact, we'll change one other thing. We'll allow the, the participant to play 10 times rather than six just so that we can get a little bit more replication than we, we saw before. But those, everything else will keep the same. The barrel is going to still begin with a total of capital N equals 1,500 containers in it. We'll always ensure that before a participant starts playing that there are K equals 120 containers that have a prize and N minus K equals 1,380 containers that are empty. So the barrel doesn't change. It's just the behavior of the participant that changes. So the operator of the game still notices that one participant seems to be playing regularly and that they are winning regularly. So when they observe this participant to play 10 times on one day, we find that out of each of the sessions of 20 selections, that participant receives the following number of containers that contain a prize. An array of 5, 6, 6, 10, 6, 5, 9, 11, 6, and 4. So we store that array under our experimental data set of D, that's the name of the variable, and then we proceed exactly as before. We set up our hypergeometric distribution parameters to represent the reality of the game. It always starts out with 1,500 plastic containers, of which K equals 120 have a prize, but now our sample size is N equals 20. Same hypothesis before, same null hypothesis as before, and then we calculate our p-values in the same way as before. So when we run our code this time, make this a little bit more visible, we can see that all of our p-values are significant. And it's because we've reduced the stakes of looking at, for instance, the difference between five and six prizes out of 20 selections is a p-value of 1.7594 times 10 to the negative 2, which is pretty significant, 1.75%, versus about half that, three point, well, more than, less than half of that, but 3.5283 times 10 to the negative 3, so 0.035%. So they're both significant. It's not a major jump between the two. So we're, we're looking at a finer mesh of p, possible p-values because our sample size is bigger. It's allowing for more um, options within our, our experiment. So same participant, same barrel, just a different rule to the game. You're allowed to select 20 containers at once instead of just Five. And that design change made it possible to pretty conclusively determine that you know, these results look significant. If the null hypothesis was true, that this participant is just selecting at random like any ordinary person, then we would not expect to see data like theirs very often as reflected by these very small p-values that are all in the range of uh, you know, 10 to the negative 2 all the way up to 10 to the negative 7, I think I saw in one case. And only one of those p-values was insignificant, the last one, 6.9315 times 10 to the negative 2. That was almost 7%. But the rest were very significant. So we'd probably conclude that it's likely that something is going on in this example. Our next test involves the geometric distribution, and so it's called the geometric test, and we'll illustrate it with this example. A small company employs six data entry specialists. It's essential that these employees are able to accurately enter information into the company databases. Recently, it's been determined that these employees committed their first data entry error after 10, 6, 1, 0, 2, and 13 days of committing no errors, respectively. 
management determined that this performance was unacceptable. So they've decided to take steps to improve the results. First, they're going to develop a baseline to compare any future performance against in order to determine if, if any improvements that they see are, are significant. And they're going to model their existing performance with a geometric distribution in order to achieve that baseline. So to do that, they're going to need to estimate the unknown parameter p from the geometric distribution using maximum likelihood estimation. So we'll take our data that we've already observed, our control data that describes what's currently going on, feed that to the MLE function, and then specify that we're modeling our data with a geometric distribution. And that should provide us with a reasonably good estimate for the unknown parameter p. Then they're going to send the data entry specialists to a weekend-long training retreat in hopes that the training will result in a significant increase in the number of days it takes before they observe their first error, their first data entry error. Therefore, they establish the null hypothesis, H sub zero, which says there will be no significant increase in the number of error-free days observed after the retreat before the first data entry error occurs. Well, in order to determine what happens, they just put the data entry specialists back to work after the retreat. And what they observe is that the specialists committed their first data entry errors after 8, 29, 8, 2, 33, and 18 days, respectively. So management decides to assess the effectiveness of their training by computing p-values for each of those pieces of data using our model, model distribution, the geometric distribution. We're testing for a significant increase. We want to determine if these numbers of days required to see the, or the number of error-free days required to see the first data entry error are significantly higher than what we were seeing before the training camp, the training retreat. Well, to test for a significant increase with MATLAB's GeoCDF function, we decrease each of our experimental data points by one, provide the estimated parameter of p and the upper flag in order to indicate that we are testing in the upper tail. And if we run this block of code, look at our p-values, we see that it's a mixed bag, 25% Six percent, or 0 0.06%, 25%, 70%, 0.03%, and 4.5%. Some of those are significant values and others are not. It's a pretty even split. And you have to decide what we're going to make of that. You know, the question that we're trying to deal with is should we accept or reject the null hypothesis? Null hypothesis stated there will be no significant increase in the number of error-free days observed after the retreat. Well, some of the employees performed better than what was typical, significantly better, and the remaining employees did not. Some of them even performed worse than what was typical. So that that's pretty classic example of an inconclusive result. I would argue that this result could be interpreted as another failure of experimental design. But this time, what I would even suggest is that perhaps we're using the wrong distribution in order to gain the information that we want. We want to know if the employees are capable as a group of doing better in terms of committing data, fewer data entry errors, data entry errors less frequently, you know, that, that kind of thing after their, their training retreat. So one thing that we could recognize is that it's a pretty high stakes thing to say that an entire day has to go by with no data entry errors. This geometric distribution, the way we've set this up, whether they have one data entry error on the ninth day or one million data entry errors on the ninth day, treats that as the same. They would, that would, that would result in a random variable value of 
eight under under those circumstances. But clearly, the person that's entering one million data entry errors on that ninth day is doing far worse than the one that just did one. So we'd like to maybe have a way of, of capturing that. And probably the best thing to do would be to look for a new distribution. And in our next example, we're going to work with the Poisson distribution, which describes the probability of observing a number of outcomes over an interval of time and space, and that might be the right tool for this job as well. We could, instead of counting the number of days that go by before the first data entry error occurs, we could just count the number of data entry, entry errors that occur on each day, and then model that data with the Poisson distribution. So this whole experiment could be redesigned with a different distribution, and we might find that we get more conclusive, more reliable results. But as this one stands, we really don't have much that we can do to improve things other than perhaps work with more employees to add some replication into our system. But right now we've got pretty inconclusive data, and if I were the management of this company, I wouldn't be feeling like I've learned a whole lot from the experiment. Nevertheless, this demonstrates mechanically how the geometric distribution can be used for hypothesis testing. Well, our final discrete hypothesis test is the Poisson test, and it's named that way because it's based upon the Poisson distribution. Now, we've seen an earlier example related to the Poisson distribution where a telecommunications engineer was trying to determine whether or not some seismic events seem to be tied to an increase in the number of data transmission errors in a fiber opt underwater fiber optic network every day compared to what she would expect. And so she's going to just formalize the procedure that she followed in that previous example in this example. So this telecommunications engineer is deciding to formalize her procedure for determining whether or not to replace the fiber optic channel in response to an apparently high number of observed transmission errors during a one-day interval, in fact, during several one-day intervals. Her expected error rate under conditions that she would consider normal was lambda equals 53.33 errors per day. She, she expected to see that many errors per day, and those errors could be handled. You just resubmitted the communication packets and um, got, got the new data after that. So instead of arbitrarily replacing the line when she sees more than 100 errors per day, which was her threshold for replacement before, she decides to use hypothesis testing. She, she decides to compute p-values for the error counts that she actually observes. So after an underwater seismic event that she believes probably damaged the line, she observes on five consecutive weekdays that there were 88, 71, 97, 83, and 88 errors on each of those days. So she stores that data in an array that she associates with the variable D. Now notice none of those error counts in a given day exceeded the 100 errors per day threshold. So all of those values would have, under her previous methodology, suggested to her that she should leave the channel alone. She should leave the uh, fiber optic channel alone and not replace it. So she's going to test to see if these are significantly high compared to what they, she would have expected. So she states a null hypothesis. It says there will be no significant increase in the number of transmission errors detected in the line per day given that the expected number of errors per day is lambda equals 53.33. This is all after the, the seismic event has happened. So the p-values that she computes are just going to be computed using the Poisson distribution. And we're testing for an increase again. So we're going to, for the random variable, we're going to insert our entire data set decreased by 1, 
we're going to specify the lambda value of 53.33. Those are our normal operating conditions, and we state that we're doing a test in the upper tail. So if we run this block of code, we get the following p-values. And if you look at these, they're all significant, many of them very significant. And yet, if we had gone with the arbitrary, you don't replace the line until you exceed the 100 error per day threshold, none of these would have triggered a line replacement because they're all fewer than 100 errors per day. And so what that can tell us is that that arbitrary threshold was probably too conservative because under normal operating conditions, you would not, just based on these p-values, expect to see any of these numbers of errors per day, except in very rare outlying circumstances. And the fact that we're seeing low p-values on five consecutive days is pretty indicative that there's something wrong. There's something that can't be explained by just ordinary null hypothesis behavior. So she should investigate what's going on with the line and possibly consider replacing it. Our next series of examples are hypothesis tests in which the model distribution is a continuous distribution. We'll be computing some pretty small probabilities in these examples, so it's going to make sense to display our numerical output in scientific notation. We'll do that once again by issuing the format short e command. If we run that block of code that's taken care of, we can move on to our first example, which uses the normal distribution, specifically the standard normal distribution as our sampling distribution. So we're going to run the z-test in this example. So from experience, we assume that the weights of livestock sampled from a herd can be treated as a normally distributed random variable with a theoretical mean of mu equals 2,000 pounds and a theoretical standard deviation of sigma equals 150 pounds. A ranch manager is assessing whether administering a growth hormone to the herd will result in significant increases in the average weight. So he'll test the formal null hypothesis in order to determine this. H sub zero, which states the mean of weights of a sample of 25 cows who have been given the growth hormone will not be significantly different from the theoretical mean of mu equal 2000. So in order to perform the experiment, the ranch manager randomly samples 25 cows from the herd and treats them with the growth hormone. Once they reach maturity, he measures their weights. These are given in the following array that I'm not going to read, but if we look at them, many of the weights are above 2,000 pounds. Some of them are a little bit below. A little bit of arithmetic intuition might lead you to suspect that the mean of this data set is going to be greater than 2,000, and in fact, that's going to turn out to be the case, but we can make MATLAB do that computation for us. But here's, how, here's the plan for what we're going to do. We know the weights of the livestock are assumed to be a normally distributed random variable with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. And so the ranch manager computes the z statistic given by the sample mean minus the theoretical mean divided by the standard error or the theoretical standard deviation over the root of the sample size. Now that z statistic will have a standard normal distribution and this is justified by the central limit theorem. So the ranch manager plans to use this fact in order to test for the significant increase, you know, understanding that the, the theoretic or the, the sample mean is going to turn out to be greater than 2000. So he's going to be testing for a, a significant increase in the average weight in response to this administration of the growth hormone. So the null hypothesis is really just a, a verbal way of stating that z is less than or equal to zero. So in order to carry out this test, the ranch manager computes the sample mean and the z statistic for d. These two lines of code accomplish that. And then finally, the test itself, the computation of the p-value, just involves plugging the z statistic into the normal CDF function or the norm CDF function with the optional flag of upper. 
Notice I have not specified values for the mean and the standard deviation to the normal distribution in this case, because if you omit those, MATLAB assumes that the mean and standard deviation are 0 and 1, or that you're using a standard normal distribution. So let's run our, our block of code. We can, in fact, see that the mean of our data set was greater than 2,000. It was 2,129.1 pounds and the corresponding z-statistic was 4.3. Well, if we calculate the p-value for that z-statistic, it turns out to be quite small. So that does indicate that our null hypothesis is probably not an adequate description of the data that we've collected after administering the growth hormone. It's indicative that there's something going on, and more study might allow you to determine, especially through replication, that it's a good possibility that the growth hormone is having its desired effect. Our next example still works with the standard normal distribution in the z-test, but it addresses the fairly common issue of not knowing the theoretical standard deviation for the population that you're sampling from. In a nutshell, as long as you are collecting a large enough sample and think that you understand that your variability in your sample is is due mostly just to measurement error, then it's it's not a terrible idea just to approximate the population or theoretical standard deviation with your sampling standard deviation. And that's that's what we're going to do in this example. So we, we have a high school science class that's experimenting with the effect of salt water upon the freezing point of water. So we have a high school science class that's experimenting with the effect of salt upon the freezing point of water. They know that the freezing point of water at standard temperature and pressure conditions is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. They've been told that salt lowers the freezing point of water, but in order to verify this, they go out and collect 50 100 milliliter samples of seawater and record the temperature needed to cause ice to begin forming in each one. The resulting data is given below in the array that we've associated with the variable d. And if you just casually inspect that array, just about all, if not all, of the temperature measurements are substantially below 32 degrees. And so we want to see if those values are low enough to cause the mean of our sample to be significantly smaller than expected, significantly smaller than 32 degrees. So what they do is they're going to test their average freezing points of their samples against the standard normal sampling distribution calibrated with a mean of mu equal 32. But since their sample is large, they estimate the standard deviation, the theoretical standard deviation, with just their sample standard deviation. So we calculate the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, and we use the sample standard deviation as sigma. So they're going to invoke the central limit theorem in order to conclude that the z-test statistic computed in the usual way, sample mean minus theoretical mean, divided by theoretical standard deviation over the root of the sample size, is approximately normal. Well, their null hypothesis is going to state that the sample average freezing point is not significantly less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So stated formally, we're just going to say that our null hypothesis is, is that the sample mean is greater than or equal to 32. Well, the p-value for that test is one for a lower tail, because we're testing to see if there's a significant decrease in our average temperature measurements. So all we've got to do is compute our z-statistic as we've done and supply it to the normal CDF function. Without a statement of what the mean or standard deviation are, because with those parameters unspecified, norm CDF will just assume that you're working with a standard normal distribution, or one with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So let's run our code in this section and see what the results are. And we can see that our sample mean was in fact quite a bit smaller than, uh, than 32 degrees. It's 
28 and a half degrees roughly. Our sample standard deviation was about 0.9 and our Z statistic was negative 2.6901 so that does indicate that the sample mean was smaller than the theoretical mean and then the associated p-value for that z statistic was really quite small. It was 1.072 times 10 to, 100 and 10 to the negative 159. So for all reasonable purposes, that's a p-value of zero. You just wouldn't expect to see freezing points of you know, values that are clustering around uh, 28, 28 and a half degrees if the water was pure. These school children are probably going to conclude that the addition of salt to the water had a significant effect. We can continue with this salt water example, but we might ask, well, what happens if you don't have time to collect 50 data points, collect 50 samples, try to freeze all of them and determine which, you know, what, what the temperatures are at which Point ice begins to form. So maybe they only have time to collect 10 data points instead of 50. That's getting into a situation where it's a pretty small sample, it's a pretty small number of values to be using in order to be estimating our unknown theoretical st standard deviation. It's also getting to the point where our sample is maybe small enough that we're not really as justified in invoking the, the uh, central limit theorem. Because the central limit theorem says that if you've got a sample of data taken from a population with a known theoretical standard deviation and mean, then the normal distribution will describe the behavior of the sample means better and better as the sample size gets larger and larger. And we're in small sample, sample size territory here, so we're really dealing with two problems. We don't have that big of a data set for reliably estimating the theoretical standard deviation, and our sample is not really big enough to justify invoking the central limit theorem to allow us to conclude that our sample means are going to have a normal distribution as a, as a sampling distribution. So all hope isn't lost. There's things that we can do, and in particular, we can just switch distributions. We can use the more appropriate t-distribution to model the behavior of our sample means, and then use the t-test to determine if those sample means are deviating significantly from what we expect. And that's what we'll do in this example. So we suppose that the students in our previous example only collected 10 data points instead of 50. And their measurements are given in this array. And we, we look at the array and they're still all quite a bit below 32 degrees. So that's anecdotally suggestive that something's happened once you've added salt to the water and the freezing points seem to be superficially lower. So we wanna determine if, it's, if that difference is more than superficial. So what we do is we still state that our theoretical mean for freezing points in pure water is going to be 32 degrees, but we're going to test it against a t-sampling distribution with 9 degrees of freedom because there are 10 data points. So the way that works, the way that we, we, we do that test is that we've got to compute a t-statistic. And the t-statistic is computed just like a z statistic, except the sample standard deviation is what appears in the denominator instead of the, in this case, unknown theoretical standard deviation. So the t statistic and the t distribution and the t test essentially solve all of our problems in this example. So we compute our, our sample mean, our sample standard deviation, and use those to compute the t statistic, and then we use the t distribution, the TCDF function, to determine if that resulting t-statistic is significantly lower than what we would expect for pure water. So let's run our block of code and see what happens. So 
our p-value turns out to be 7.4983 times 10 to the negative 8. So that's probably small enough to reject a null hypothesis that the freezing point isn't going to d decrease significantly from, from 32 degrees. Um, it's not quite as dramatic as the 10 to the negative 159 that we saw with the normal data, but that's because we had a lot more data. So this is still very significant, and it's indicative that the school children should think that something is going on as a result, possibly, of adding salt to the water. You know, these, these freezing points are significantly lower than what we would expect if it was just pure water. Our final example of hypothesis testing with a continuous distribution is actually going to show us a technique of how to use the T distribution and the T test in this case, although you could in some cases use the normal distribution as well if there's enough data av available to justify invoking the central limit theorem. But we're going to use those tests to revisit some of our discrete tests that we saw earlier on. And so I want to recall the state fair game operator who suspected that one of his participants might have been cheating in a game where the participants were allowed to select n equals 5 containers from a barrel of 1,500 containers, of which 120 contained the prize. So those values set up the sample size, total population size, and preferred population size parameters for a hypergeometric distribution. Now in that example, we use the hypergeometric distribution to model normal behavior, and we tested whether or not numbers of prizes that that participant was finding were significantly high compared to what was expected on a on a case by case basis and that participant went out and selected five containers won two prizes five more containers won one prize three more or five more containers and three prizes came from those and then in the remaining three sets of five containers each had one prize within them and so the game operator in that, that previous example applied a hypergeometric test in order to determine if that pri those prize counts on a case-by-case -case basis were significantly high. And he found that it was a mixed bag. Some were significant, some were very insignificant. The results were inconclusive. One way that we dealt with those inconclusive results was just to redesign the game and allow participants to select 20 containers at a time instead of five. And that just gave us a better granularity to allow us to detect whether somebody was winning significantly high numbers of prizes or not. But another thing that we could do is just change the question that we're asking. We could say we're interested in knowing if that participant is winning too many times on average rather than too many times on each round of play. And so to do that, we look at our data set D as a small sample. We can say, well, we can, we can say that that small sample has a sample mean and a sample standard deviation, and then we can use that sample mean and sample standard deviation to compute a t-statistic. And then we can test to see if that t-statistic is unnecessarily high. Now, we've got to use the t distribution. And the t distribution accepts a t, that t statistic as the input, number of degrees of freedom as the parameter input, and we know that the degrees of freedom are just going to be the sample size decreased by one, so that's what I've highlighted there. And then we're testing for a significant increase, so we supply the upper flag. So if we run that block of code, we'll see that our mean is 1.5, our sample standard deviation is 8.3666 times 10 to the negative 1, so about 0.8. And then the t-statistic is 3.2205. When we compute the p-value for that t-statistic, we see that it takes on a value of 1.1727 times 10 to the negative 2, or just a little bit more than 1%. So we could, we could imagine that that is a somewhat significant not overwhelmingly significant, but a somewhat significant result, especially considering the small size of our sample. So the 
game operator could conclude that it's unexpected that a participant would win on average 1.5 prizes per container or per, per five containers on a repeated basis. So we would only expect to see this participant's performance about 1% of the time or, or one out of every 100 sets of five containers that, that they select. So there's probably something odd going on that the game designer ought to, uh, ought to investigate. Now you can apply this technique to any of our past discrete hypothesis test examples in which we had replication going on, in which we selected a set of experimental values rather than a single experimental value, because we could treat those sets of experimental values as a sample of data. And then we just use the t-test or the z-test if you had enough data in that sample to justify using the central limit theorem to test to see if the mean of that experimental data is significantly different from what you would expect based off of some theoretical mean that comes from the theoretical mean of your original model probability distribution. So that's just another good use of these, these continuous tests for differences in means. Thank you for watching this technological companion to the hypothesis testing video lesson. I hope you found it useful and that you will join us for our next video lesson.